Hello there. Welcome to the Wizards and Warriors channel, where we are going to be taking a deep dive today into one of the most important characters ever created for Star Wars. Now, this is a bit of a new format for us, but our other videos are not going anywhere. We will just be doing video essays from time to time. Don't worry, there will be no bisexual lightning. Ah, oh, sorry. Okay, of all the characters of Star Wars, one character in particular underwent an incredible amount of development. At some points in the script history, he simply did not exist. At other points, he was merged with other characters. Even when his archetype was finally devised, what we got on the big screen underwent an unbelievable amount of changes. I am, of course, talking about Jectano Porkins, savior of the Rebel Alliance. Haha. <laughs> no, we will be talking about the most famous Jedi Knight, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Now, what if I told you at one point, Mr. George Lucas was looking to make Star Wars a Japanese film with subtitles to give it an otherworldly feeling for Westerners, and that he had always envisioned the famous Japanese actor Toshiro Mifune to play the role of Obi-Wan Kenobi. Just look at that forceful stare. You might be asking yourself, how did we go from a samurai film actor to Sir Alec Guinness? Well, please join me on this venture into discovering how George Lucas came up with Obi-Wan Kenobi. Where can you start with such a story other than with its red Twi'lek Stan? Author George Lucas. Fresh off the success of American Graffiti, a coming-of-age comedy directed by George Lucas, which made over $115 million, the most profitable film at that time. Well, this led George Lucas to pursue a passion project about intergalactic war amongst the stars. Now, Lucas would take inspiration from a million different things throughout the development of all of his Star Wars projects. But if you were forced to choose the three largest ones, it would be Flash Gordon, films by Akira Kurosawa, and Joe Campbell's novel, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. One of the largest films that influenced Star Wars, Episode IV, New Hope, was none other than Kurosawa's 1958 masterpiece, the classic, The Hidden Fortress. Imagine, 16th century Japan, two bumbling peasants are trying to escape a war raging between two domains. Their names are Tahei and Matsushishi, and they are constantly bickering and going from one perilous situation to the next until they come across a mysterious bearded man from a secret camp in the mountains. He is the famous former Akizuki general, Makabe Ukurota, and he joins them on a quest to escort a rebel princess, Yuki, back to her homeland with what remains of her family's gold, to Hayakawa. Yuki is one of the few survivors of the Akizuki clan and being hunted by the enemy. Eventually, Ukurota runs into his old rival, Hiyoe Tadokoro, who challenges him to a lance duel. Yukirota wins, but spares Tadokoro's life and makes an escape. But he is, of course, captured by the enemy soldiers and imprisoned in a fortress. Tadokoro visits the prisoners, but now his face is disfigured by a large scar, and he explains that he received a beating by the lord of the Yamanana clan as punishment for letting Yukirota escape. Just before the prisoners are to be executed, Tadokoro suddenly changes sides and aids Gakurota and the heroes fight their way out of the fortress. Not convinced yet? How about Kurosawa's 1954 film The Seven Samurai? Tells the story of a small group of ronin who come together to defend a helpless farming village from onslaughting raiders. The ronin were once samurai, a separate caste, who are devoted to an honorable Bushido code. Their weapon is a two-handed katana, and amongst the ronin, there is an aging but experienced ronin named Kambei. The farming villagers find Kambei rescuing a young boy being harassed by a thief. A younger samurai named Katsushiro asks to become Kambei's disciple. Kambei finds fellow ronin to help the villagers train to defend against the marauders. Then there is Kurosawa's 1961 film Yojimbo, whose main protagonist is Kuobatake Sanjuro, a wandering ronin and master swordsman. While traveling near a farmhouse, Sanjuro finds out an elderly farmer's couple's son does not want to waste his life 
as a farmer. So he runs off and he joins a group of gambler bandits who are trying to overrun the local town. Sanjuro heads to the town where he seeks to rid them of the gambler bandits. And in one rather famous scene, Sanjuro is confronted by the gamblers who inform him they are serious criminals and have received death sentences in over 12 different jurisdictions. And in the flash of an eye, Sanjuro slices one of the criminal's arms off before walking off without even breaking a sweat. Sanjuro eventually leads a group of resistance to defeat the gambler bandits while saving a local farmer's wife. I am sure you can see how someone like George Lucas, who loved samurai films, could be inspired by such works. But what about Japanese culture in general? Let us consider Obi-Wan Kenobi's name. Obi, meaning one's sash for their kimono. Ken, a type of Japanese sword. And personally, I have always found the word wan just a little bit similar phonetically to connotating something else that's Japanese-like. And it's found interestingly in other words like padawan as well. Wan also is very close sounding to san, the Japanese word that is the title of respect added to one's name. So perhaps he was playing off of that. Lucas has gone on the record to say Kenobi was meant to phonetically sound like a Japanese warrior's name. If you wanted to be literal, his name is Sword Sash, kind of fits. It's no coincidence that Lucas chose a Japanese sounding name for the role. He actually asked Mifune, who declined thinking the role would diminish the image of the samurai. Oh, poor Mifune, if only he could see what has become of the samurai class today. Lucas would ask him afterwards to take the role of Darth Vader, as his face would be covered, but Mifune turned him down again. Ia means Ia, Mr. Lucas. If you want to go further down the rabbit hole, Lucas said that he, if he had secured Mifune, he would have dramatically changed the entire casting for the film. He would have cast a Japanese actress for the princess and a black man for Han Solo. You have guessed it, Lando Calrissian might have graced the big screen with his cape even earlier. At that point, Lucas wanted to do the film in Japanese and have subtitles. Not so sure how that would have gone with American audiences. You can't scroll Reddit and read subtitles at the same time. Lucas never cared or just didn't know about Reddit. He sought to capture the feeling of disorientation when one watches a foreign film and sees a different set of customs, history, language, and exotic mannerisms. Something that would capture the essence of a world not like ours. Despite not securing his dream actor, Lucas kept the Japanese name and much of the Japanese cultural influences throughout Star Wars. You can certainly see it everywhere. Let's take for example the term Jedaigeki, which is Japanese for period drama, set during the Edo period. Did you hear any similarity between Jedi Geki and Jedi? It's not a coincidence. It was Lucas paying homage. We see you, Mr. Lucas. All the films I had mentioned are Jedi Geki, such as The Hidden Fortress, showcasing the trials and tribulations of samurai, peasants, and the powerful daimyo, or shogun. The world of Edo Japan gave birth to the Jedi, from their clothes to their choice of weapon, even their code of ethics. Bushido and the Jedi Code emphasize discipline, morality, and compassion. The samurai were bound by honor to be protectors, but like the Jedi, not all samurai were good, so to say. Whether it be the result of failing to protect their master, breaking their Bushido Code, or just being down on their luck, some of the samurai became ronin. And how about the relationship? between samurai and ronin to that of Jedi and the Sith. The samurai serve their master. The ronin are masterless, as they serve none but themselves, much like the Sith. Though obviously not a perfect analogy by any means. It is also not to say all ronin were driven by greed, fear, hate, and lust for power. But the themes can definitely be seen. How about the attire of the samurai? The most recognizable thing in Star Wars is of course, Darth Vader's helmet, clearly inspired by a samurai helmet, though notably imbued with the German Stahlhelm too. The American illustrator Ralph McQuarrie and British sculptor Brian Murray created Vader's helmet in 1976 and they took inspiration from the helmet of Date Masemune, a famous feudal lord of the Edo period. Take away the crescent-shaped ornament on top, add some black American graffiti, I'm sorry, paint, and you almost have Vader's helmet. Masamune's helmet and armor were also iconically black to boot. As for Obi-Wan Kenobi, he was inspired by General Makabe Mikurota, 
And this Jedi garb, a robe and tunic, looks distinctly like a samurai kimono and sash. Both the Jedi and Sith fight with lightsabers, often holding them in two hands, dueling in a katana-like manner. Lucas combined his passion for Japan Chambara films with another love, Flash Gordon. Flash. No, not that Flash Gordon. The old Flash Gordon from the movie serials from the 1930s. These serials ran around 10 to 20 minutes each in weekly installments. The 1936 serial, Flash Gordon, and its sequel, Flash Gordon Conquers the Universe, gives us a ton of insight into how Lucas came up with episode 4, a galactic empire led by the megalomaniac emperor Ming the Merciless, threatens to destroy Earth. Ming is going to ram our quickly becoming Tatooine-like planet with his deadly planet Mongo. To stop Ming, Flash Gordon and Prince Baron travel aboard a rocket to Mongo, where they infiltrate Ming Fortress. On Mongo, they come across Princess Aura and save an animal-like ally, Prince Thun. The Lion Men. Prince Thun was fighting in an arena city in the sky, ruled by a villain who turns hero and joins them. Yes, a lot of Star Wars is owed to Flash Gordon. And of course, most famously, the title crawl is from Flash Gordon. Initially, Lucas sought to remake the serials, but the license was not available, so he moved on to other ideas, such as his love of Kurosawa films. But what Flash Gordon did the most for inspiration was showcasing how technology can take on the role of magic for traditional fairy tales. A third runner-up that would cause significant influence on Star Wars, which George Lucas came across later on, was writer Joseph Campbell's 1949 book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. The book was built upon the work of German anthropologist Adolf Bastian, who first proposed the idea that myths from all over the world seem to be built from the same elementary ideas. Psychoanalyst from a neutral country, Carl Jung, would go on to name these elemental ideas as archetypes, which he argued are the building blocks not only for our unconscious mind, but for the collective unconscious. Four years of university to get my degree in neuroscience has finally paid off, mom. Now, speaking about archetypes, three are of great importance to Star Wars. The model of hero, mentor, and quest. Campbell demonstrated that all stories are expressions of the same story pattern, which he liked to call the monomyth, or the hero's journey. To go big brain on this, the hero's journey was based on what Carl Jung called the unconscious myth, the notion of cultural archetypes and that of the collective unconscious, which he felt provided the foundation of mythological thinking for all cultures. He viewed the hero's journey as a simultaneous journey of the ego to achieve oneness with the world, overcoming one's fear of both the id and the superego, like that of a seductive mother and an ogre-like father. And I bet that sounded super weird. Think of it like this. The id is our instinctual self, our primitive desires, bodily needs, and such. Our superego is our morality, cultural rules, what we've been taught. The ego is the mediator between the id and the superego. It seeks to please the id's desires, but not at the cost of the superego. Don't worry if you don't get all of that. Jung was a psychoanalyst like Freud, and we all know psychoanalysis is pseudo-psychology. Shots fired. To Campbell, the hero's journey is found in all cultures, from the Greek myths of Jason and the Golden Fleece, and Odysseus's journey to the legends of King Arthur, hell, to the Sumerian epic of Gilgamesh. Now Campbell argued all religions and myths contain the hero's journey story. So let's take our character, Obi-Wan Kenobi. What archetype do you think he fits the most? Of course, he is the mentor who helps the hero, Luke, undergo a quest. A part of being a mentor, as described by Campbell, is to give the hero supernatural aid. When a hero has decided to go on a quest, a mentor with special powers appears to aid him. This mentor gives the hero magical aids like amulets, talismans, or weapons. They're also usually in the form of a wise old man. Think of Merlin or Gandalf, which means bearded, I guess. Now, I do not want this simply to become a list of what franchises and literature which influenced the creation of Obi-Wan Kenobi. What I find truly fascinating is how the character went from ideas in the head of Mr. George Lucas straight onto some pieces of paper. What did the earliest concepts of Obi-Wan Kenobi look like? How did he go from that to what we saw on the big screen in 1977. Hell, during this story, his character development did not stop even while shooting of the film was going on, believe it or not. Of all the characters that Lucas would create for Star Wars Episode 4, 
none will be changed as much or undergo as much development as Obi-Wan Kenobi. So going back to Lucas being fresh off American graffiti, he wrote a two-page outline called The Journal of Wills. It was a rather confusing and weird structured story with a thin plot. The story revolved around Mace Windy, a revered Jedi Bendu of Upechi, told to us by C.J. Thorpe, a Padawan learner to the famed Jedi. C.J. tells us that at the age of 16, another Padawan named Chewie entered the Inter-System Academy to train as a potential Jedi Templar, and it was also there that C.J. became a Padawan to Mace Windy. Mace Windy was also a warlord serving the head of an alliance of independent systems which opposed the Galactic Empire. Mace Windy becomes the victim of a court conspiracy because many fear him to be too powerful, perhaps even more powerful, than the imperial leader of the Galactic Empire. He is dismissed from the royal forces and replaced. Once dismissed, Windy and his Padawan go on a journey, and the narrative trails off into what would be part two. Lucas handed the outline to his agent, Jeff Berg, who couldn't understand the damn thing. So Lucas started all over again. You're a real mensch, Jeff. We don't understand what any of that means, thank you. Still, how crazy is it that we basically had a lot of this plot for the prequels right there, even though it was just a jumble of ideas. Everything is here, save for the Metachlorians. Certainly, we see Mace Windy becoming a certain someone later on. But where is our Obi-Wan Kenobi in all of this? Now, when Lucas gave it a second try, this is when he patterned it around the story of Kurosawa's films but he would come back to the Journal of the Wills for the prequels. In the spring of 1937, Lucas wrote a 14-page titled Star Wars Story Synopsis, often referred to as the first treatment of Star Wars. I believe this is the best place for our little story to really begin about the famed Jedi Knight, Obi-Wan Kenobi. From an eerie blue-green planet called Aquilia, we see in the vastness of space a gargantuan space fortress being attacked by starfighters. Then suddenly, the scene changes to a rebel princess who is fleeing across the galaxy with her loyal retainers and a certain treasure. It is the 33rd century. A civil war is raging and the Empire is hunting the princess. She is guarded by General Luke Skywalker as they come across two bumbling bureaucrats who have escaped the space fortress and landed on Aquilia. The group must travel to a spaceport city of Gordon, where they hope to get a spacecraft to take them to a friendly planet of Upechi. They eventually come across a ruined temple where a band of rebel boys are hiding, and one of the rebel boys and the general go to a cantina on the outskirts of the spaceport. A group of the bullies taunt one of the rebel boys who is forced into a fight, but in a flash, General Skywalker slashes the bully, chin to groin, with his laser sword. The laser sword goes back into its sheath on the blink of an eye. All of that doesn't even happen in the wretched hive of scum and villainy. Our heroes eventually get a spacecraft, but crash land on Yavin, where General Skywalker ends up battling aliens riding giant bird-like creatures. He uses his blaster. So uncivilized but ends up in single combat against an alien leader, cutting him in half with his laser sword. The princess is captured and imprisoned in an imperial capital of Alderaan. General Luke and the rebel boys infiltrate the prison and free the princess. So basically, it's a synopsis from Kurosawa's The Hidden Fortress. Let me read it to you. It is the 16th century, a period of civil wars, a princess with her family, her retainers, and the clan treasure is being pursued. If they can cross enemy territory and reach a friendly province, they will be saved. The enemy knows this and posts a reward for the capture of the princess. And now, here's the earliest Lucas synopsis for Star Wars. It is the 33rd century. A period of civil war is in the galaxy. A rebel princess with her family, her retainers, and the clan treasure are being pursued. If they can cross the territory controlled by the Empire and reach a friendly planet, they will be saved. The Sovereign knows this and he posts a reward for the capture of the princess. So, we have a princess, rebels, and two bickering bureaucrats. They are all similar to what will become Star Wars later on. But who exactly is this General Luke Skywalker? He seems to be both the hero 
and the mentor all in one. Lucas submitted this one to the United Artists in May of 1973, and it was rejected because the projected budget was over $3 million. It was then handed to Universal, whom failed to make a decision by the 10-day allocation given to them. So, it was then given to Fox. No, not that one, with the gay frogs or whatever they're doing this week. It was given to the 20th Century Fox, who accepted it with an option to bail out at any time and a bootstrap budget. So now, Lucas had to write an actual screenplay. During what would take a year to write the full rough copy, Lucas would watch war movies like 1954's The Bridges at Tokori and videotaped dogfighting sequences. For him, it was a way of getting a sense of the movement of spaceships. He read John Carpenter of Mars and got the idea of a classic space opera. He continued the struggle, however, with a coherent plot, instead writing character development for such characters as General, the Princess, and the Rebel Boy, who was now being named Starkiller. He came up with the thing called a Death Star, something large and sinister. Starkiller would be a boy, but through the story he would become a man. Eventually more names emerged, beginning with Kane Heisinger, a Jedi friend, Leia Aquilia, a princess, General Vader, an Imperial commander, Han Solo, an old friend. Even the names of C-3PO and R2-D2 sprang up, listed as workmen or robots, similar to the ones from 1927 silent film Metropolis. He, I mean Lucas, not R2, would finally complete the rough draft in May of 1974, and it looked quite different. So Lucas kept rewriting and came up with another rough draft that involved the Jedi Bendu Kane Starkiller and his two sons, 10-year-old Deke, and an 18-year-old Anakin, who would live on the fourth move of Utapa in the Kessel system. Their peaceful lives are interrupted by the arrival of Imperial forces and a crashed Sith ship. Suddenly, something huge moves in front of his field of view. Before either of the two boys can react, a large, sinister Sith warrior in black robes and a face mask looms over them. He carries a long laser sword, which cuts young Deke down before he or his brother are able to raise their weapons. That is not too family friendly, George. Anyways, Anakin manages to fend off the seven foot tall Sith Knight until Cain leaps in, cutting the masked warrior in half. They bury Deke, and then the exiles realize they can't stay there, so they have to set off for their home planet of Quilia. Meanwhile, on Alderaan, the Empire's new capital, the Emperor plots the destruction of Aquilia and the last of the Jedi. The tall, grim-looking General Darth Vader argues the conquest of Aquilia will be difficult because they are led by General Luke Skywalker, a large, imposing man in his 60s. General Skywalker has been advocating for an active resistance against the Empire, while many Aquilian senators seek capitulation. The King of Aquilia, named Chaos, invites General Skywalker to say goodbye to his two sons, Biggs, Windy, and his 14-year-old daughter, Princess Leia. Eventually, Cain Starkiller shows up with his son Anakin. He asks his old friend, the aging General Skywalker, to take his son as a Padawan learner. Skywalker asks why, and Cain reveals that most of his body is now mechanical, and that all that remains flesh is his head and his right arm. He has lost too much and is dying. A giant space fortress attacks Aquilia, and on it are two construction robots named R2-D2 and C-3PO. Starships attack the fortress, and they can't stop the invasion led by Darth Vader. The group meets up with two droids, and decides to go to the starport of Gordon to find an old friend of Kane's. There they meet a huge green-skinned monster with no nose and large gills named Han Solo. Wow, try to imagine that being Han Solo. Sounds like the monster from the Black Lagoon. Try pitching a romance between him and Leia. They all go to the cantina, where General Skywalker cuts the arm off an attacker. They agree they have to flee the planet aboard a freighter. Some of them will have to be put in hibernation, and that requires a power source. Thus, Cain rips a piece of his mechanical chest, giving his life in return. The climax has General Skywalker trained Wookiees, which are described as being huge gray furry beasts. General Skywalker trains these Wookiees to pilot starships to attack what is being called a Death Star Fortress. Anakin infiltrates the fortress, rescues Princess Leia, defeats Black Knight of the Sith called Prince Valorum, 
who changes hearts and helps him get out of the fortress before it explodes. We can see how many characters and events would eventually become episode 4, and even parts of episode 6. But it's not quite Star Wars. What is interesting about the characters in the script is a divergence in the mentor-hero role somewhat. Anakin is now a young hero, who General Luke Skywalker mentors. So now Lucas has in mind that these need to be separate characters. General Skywalker is old. Lucas even specified in his 60s. So we're really beginning to see what is Obi-Wan Kenobi as we know him. Despite that, General Luke Skywalker is certainly still not really Obi-Wan Kenobi, the one that we know and love. Lucas made a revision of the rough draft called now the first draft, which was an enormous overhaul of name changes for characters and places, while the story itself remained pretty much unchanged. You can tell Lucas had Kurosawa on the mind at this time, as he changed Kane's name to Akira. He also changed Deke to Binks, and we all know later on what Binks is going to become, one of the most devious Sith Lords, Darth Jar Jar. Ultimately, it was cast aside for another revision known to us now as The Adventures of the Star Killer, Saga 1, The Star Wars, which was finished on January the 28th of 1975. This script involved two construction droids, 3PO and R2, who are aboard a rebel starfighter, captained by Deke Starkiller, an Aquilian Ranger and Jedi Bendu Knight. The rebel starfighter is being overwhelmed by four giant Imperial Star Destroyers, as the Imperial forces begin to board the rebel ship. Deke sends the droids to the surface of the desert planet Tapu to search for his brother Luke, living at their home with Owen Lars. Deke is then attacked by Dark Lord Vader, right hand to the master of the Sith. Vader uses an invisible force to toss objects at Deke and drains him of his energy before he is taken prisoner. Much from this point is similar to the final story. Jawas grab the droids and transport them in a sand crawler until Owen Lars purchases them. Luke has two twin brothers, Biggs and Windy, and a 16-year-old cousin named Leia. Well, I guess cousin is better than sibling. No Game of Thrones for you, Mr. Lucas. We're all introduced to Luke as he is training with a laser sword before the droid R2 shows him a hologram from Deke asking him to take the Kyber Crystal to their father named simply the Starkiller. The Kyber Crystal is basically a MacGuffin device inspired by the One Ring from Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. Luke learns the Starkiller is on Organa Major and that Deke is imprisoned on Alderaan. Luke is unsure of what to do next. Should he stay to complete his archaeology studies? Yep, he is an archaeologist in this one. Perhaps Lucas had Indy on the mind. Or does he take up the quest? He consults his siblings. And the audience gets a full rundown of the history behind the fall of the Republic and what is called the Force of Others. Basically, this is a prototype of the Force. Luke's uncle Owen turns out to be the one holding the kyber crystal and he gives it to him. Thus. Luke sets out on the quest, and he meets along the way a humanoid, Han Solo, and his 8 foot tall, baboon like companion, Chewbacca. The cantina scene plays out a bit weird in this one. Han Solo tries to defend Luke, but he fails, so Luke pulls out his laser sword and dispatches two bullies. They then travel through space and find Organa Major has mysteriously vanished, destroyed by an enormous attack. So instead, they make their way to the Imperial capital of Alderaan to rescue the imprisoned Deke. They infiltrate the Imperial city and find a near-dead Deke and use the Kyber Crystal to revitalize him. Together, they then flee to the planet Yavin, but are being pursued by a giant space station called the Death Star. On Yavin, they find, and I am quoting, the Star Killer, a wizened old man with long silver hair. He's apparently asleep. The Star Killer's crystal clear eyes open knowingly. An aura of power radiates from the ancient Jedi. The Star Killer is a large man, but shriveled and bent in an incalculable number of years. His face, cracked, weathered by exotic climates, is set off by a long silvery beard and penetrating gray blue eyes. Sounds an awful lot like Obi Wan Kenobi, but as a mummy. Luke uses the Kyber Crystal to revitalize his father, who tells him that he intends to train him as a Jedi Bendu. Starkiller also tells them that Death Star was responsible for destroying Organa Major and that they must destroy it. 
In the final clash against the Death Star, Luke attacks the exhaust port as Darth Vader attacks him, but the later is thwarted at the last minute by Han Solo. The Empire suffers a major defeat. We now have two archetypal characters, better defined. The hero Luke is young, a Padawan, Jedi, and his father, the Star Killer, is an ancient Jedi, an old wizened man, who mentors him in the way of the Force of others. It feels like Star Wars, though it certainly is not perfect by any means. It lacks something. Lucas stated in March of 1975, he had an issue. There was really no important female characters. He briefly gender swapped Luke, but then disregarded that. Then he became adamant two archetypes needed to be more profound in the script, the princess and the old man. Between the second and third draft, Lucas was pressed to give Fox executives a synopsis that would make sense, as many still did not understand his vision. He scrambled somewhat, changed Luke back to a boy, and reintroduced a princess character who was Luke's twin, as he liked the mythological significance of twins. Then. He formulated a new archetype. It had always been there before, but for the first time, it was really fleshed out. An unnamed older Jedi appeared for the first time. He was to be an elderly man, literally the wizard on the side of the road, who Luke meets along their journey. In exchange for his teachings, the old man requests payment in the form of food. A recall to Kurosawa's Seven Samurai, where the farmers pay rice for the heroes to protect their village. Lucas described the old man to have mystical powers like those of Don Juan, a reference to the teachings of Don Juan, a UK war of knowledge by Carlos Castaneda. Don Juan was a shaman with the ability to shapeshift who teaches the mastery of awareness to the point where one can escape death itself. Ironic. This concept transformed the Jedi, who had previously been much more like a samurai, into a more mythical warrior. Lucas stated he had spent years reading fairy tales, watching Kurosawa films, and recently reread Joe Campbell's The Hero with a Thousand Faces when he finally realized he needed the script to fit more into the classic mold. Campbell wrote that all mythical stories of the hero involved him going on an adventure involving trials and eventually surpassing his mentor. Lucas worked on a third draft, and by May the 1st of 1975, it was titled Star Wars from the adventures of Luke Starkiller. Here we get a much more familiar premise. Princess Leia Organa is aboard a rebel ship being hunted by Darth Vader. She carries with her the Empire's plans for the Death Star, and before her capture she gives a message to two droids, C-3PO and R2-D2. Luke Starkiller is a young moisture farmer, boy living with his uncle Owen and Aunt Beru. Luke dreams of someday becoming a mighty Jedi warrior, learning the mystical ways of the Force of Others. The Force of Others was originally referred to as just the Will, in the original Will's outline, but it was becoming more hashed out. As Lucas would describe it, from an early age he was interested in the fact all over the world people had created different religions and mythos, but they all shared this Force of Others. There is essentially a Force, God, whatever you want to call it, that is the common denominator. The script carries on, indicating that Luke wishes his late Jedi father was there with him. His uncle purchases two droids. As he cleans them, Luke comes across the hologram message from Leia. She says she's been taken to Alderaan, and that the Death Star plans must be delivered to Organa Major. Luke runs away from home with the two droids, with the intent to save the princess and he needs to find a way off the planet. On the way to the spaceport, he passes a poor old man on the side of the road. He picks the old man up, and as he does so, the old man talks about his adventures as a Jedi. Luke becomes enamored by this, and asks to become the old man's apprentice. The old man agrees, and he will train him for food. He soon gives Luke a lesson about the force of others, and shows he can do magic read minds, and talk to things like Don Juan of Castaneda. We then get the cantina scene where Luke is bullied by large bug people, and soon they start a fight. The old man suddenly cuts down the bullies. Then the heroes meet Han Solo and Chewbacca, who they pay to transport them to Alderaan. On Alderaan, 
The hero's ship is investigated by Darth Vader and other Sith Knights. The old man looks for the kyber crystal, while the others search for Leia, who is a tough babe. Han Solo punches her right in the face and Chewbacca carries her out. Bold move, Mr. Lucas. Bold move. When the old man finds the kyber crystal, it makes the Sith physically sick. It's a bit weird. As our other heroes are trying to flee, the old man runs into Darth Vader. They duel, and the old man is wounded. But at the last moment, he slams a blast door between himself and Darth Vader, and he escapes with the others. Our D&D party crash lands on Yavin, as the Death Star is making its way to the planet. Leia's plans for the Death Star indicate there is a small exhaust port. They can toss a bomb in. The climax has Luke landing on the Death Star with a bomb, and he runs into Vader, and is forced to duel him. Luke is going to lose, but Han Solo comes to the rescue, and they blow up the Death Star. Now, the entire time Lucas is writing all these drafts and outlines, he is receiving advice from those around him, notably many influential filmmakers, such as Steven Spielberg. Lucas changed a few things around based on their feedback. For one, they told him the princess needs to join the group much earlier. They also told him while the old man was perfect, he needed a name. So, Lucas named him General Ben Kenobi a wise old man and Jedi that occupies the role of mentor. He would train Luke in the ways of the Force, simply just called the Force now, by the way, to allow Luke to undergo a voyage of self-discovery. And there we have it, Kenobi, at last, if only by name. Lucas finished the third draft in August of 1975 for what is now called The Star Wars from the adventures of Luke Starkiller. Much plays out like the previous rendition, except when Luke leaves home, he now is seeking the help of an old friend of his late Jedi father, General Ben Kenobi. The later was his father's commander, and most likely the greatest of all the Jedi Knights. Now while he's searching, Luke is attacked by Tusken Raiders, but he is saved by, and I quote, a huge menacing shadow on the canyon wall gives way, shabby old desert rat of a man who appears at least to be 70 years old. His ancient leathery face, cracked and withered by exotic climates, is set off by dark, penetrating eyes. And he is scraggly, with a white beard. Ben Kenobi squints his eyes as he scrutinizes Luke in his predicament. The old man is hesitant to join Luke on his adventure, and illustrates this by showing Luke that one of his arms is mechanical, admitting he has very little force left in him. Kenobi then explains what the force is to Luke how it radiates all around us, but can only be collected and transmitted through the use of kyber crystals, which is the only way to amplify the power of the force within a person. Kenobi tells Luke that his kyber crystal was taken during the Battle of Kanduin, during which Anakin was also killed. One of Ben's disciples took the crystal and became a Sith Lord. Now we are really getting into the meat of Star Wars. Real deep fried gorg. The cantina scene plays out where Ben cuts down the bullies who attack Luke, then Ben trains Luke in the ways of the Force using a lightsaber. They go to Alderaan, and when they do, their ship touches down, but Ben states he must find the kyber crystal while the others go looking for the princess. He tells Luke, may the Force be with you. Ah, the iconic line at last. The rest plays out quite similar. Kenobi runs into Darth Vader, and they duel as the others rescue the princess. Kenobi slams the blast door down, and then they make their escape, and they land on Yavin. The only major difference in the climax is Luke not landing on the Death Star. He's instead shooting into an exhaust port with his starfighter. We have a name for the old man, but it's not quite finished. There's certainly something like a last piece of the puzzle missing, so to speak. Now at this point, production was kicking off. Things were being built, such as R2-D2's costume. But Lucas was still writing a fourth draft, even as the actors were being interviewed for the parts in the film. Lucas envisioned a James Dean kind of cowboy character for Han. He wanted a strong independent woman playing Leia, someone capable of leading her people, not a fairy tale kind of princess. Lucas, once again, showed that he is no stranger to weebdom. As I mentioned, he originally considered making the entire film in Japanese with subtitles. What I also mentioned was that Lucas envisioned Toshiro Mifune to play the role of Kenobi, but Mifune refused. While pursuing Mifune, he was also considering another legend. 
the only person who is both a Jedi Master and a Roman Emperor, Sir Alec Guinness. While Alec Guinness was shown the script, Lucas had left sketches for the film in it. Alec Guinness called him two hours later, stating, I love this. I'm very interested in it. Now, Guinness had barely glanced at the script. When he found out what type of genre the film was, he nearly turned it down. But because it was George Lucas, fresh, off of the very well-acclaimed American graffiti, hmm, well, he chose to give it a shot. To quote the legendary actor, Oh Lord, I've never done a science fiction film, but because of Lucas, I started reading it and I found myself involved. It had a touch of Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. It was a rather simple outline of a good man who had some magical powers. It was an adventure story about the passing of knowledge and the sword from one generation to the next. The movie was not even fully greenlit, and Lucas was being pelted by questions from Fox executives who were trying to decide if they should follow through or bail. One question they asked was how he conceived the characters. Lucas told them the original idea was to make a movie about an old man and a kid. They would have a teacher-student relationship. He wanted the old man to be real old, but also a warrior. Originally, the old man was a hero, something like a 75-year-old Clint Eastwood. But the more he wrote, the more of the script revolved more and more around the kid. Lucas admitted he did not know much about old people. He was having a hard time coping with it. So he ended up writing the kid better than the old man. Lucas was still not done altering the story, and the alterations would go on during the film. Lucas would be changed to not really know much about his Jedi father, whom Ben Kenobi would tell him about. Ben Kenobi's cantina scene showed him as a cranky old man who pulls out his laser sword and cuts down three guys in a second. But it was made to make the audience realize, you know, this old man is a master. There's more than meets the eyes. At this point, Lucas was already thinking about sequels, extending the soap opera of the Skywalker family and the destruction of the Empire. But he was also thinking of prequels, a backstory about Kenobi as a young man, a story about the Jedi, and how an evil man took over the Republic and turned it into an empire by tricking the Jedi and killing them. Luke's father would be killed in the process, an impossible thing to film, but it was a great thing to dream about. Pretty nuts to think that even at the beginning, Lucas had hashed out so much of the greater Star Wars franchise. Lucas would come up with a fourth draft on January the 1st of 1976. The title, The Adventures of Luke Starkiller, as taken from the Journal of the Wills, Saga 1. It is very much the Star Wars we all know, with a lot of additional characters added, such as Biggs, Moff Tarkin, and such. The difference now had Princess Leia's hologram message telling Luke he needs to find Ben Kenobi. Luke is saved by Ben Kenobi after Tusken Raiders attack him. Ben tells Luke the Jedi had been hunted across the galaxy by Darth Vader and the Sith. This time, Luke doesn't know that his father was a Jedi. Ben gives Luke his father's lightsaber, and then the group finds out Luke's aunt and uncle are murdered by stormtroopers. Luke asks to join Ben on his quest and for Ben to teach him the ways of the Force, so he can too become a Jedi, like his father. Much of the same happens, the cantina scene followed by an escaped. However, now the Alderaan prison scene had changed to the group simply going directly to the Death Star, where Leia is imprisoned. On the Death Star, Ben separates from the rest of the group who are going to save the princess. But in this script, the Kyber Crystal is no longer a thing. Ben instead is going to disengage the tractor beam so that they can all fly away. The duel occurs, the blast door slams, they all escape the Death Star, and later on it's destroyed. Now at this point, Lucas envisioned a backstory with Vader killing Luke's father and confronting Ben, who had almost killed Vader in return. The reason Vader is half-machine is because of his injuries that he received from Ben. In fact, Lucas envisioned Vader falling into a volcanic pit and catching on fire. Vader symbolizes the ambivalence towards technology, or more accurately towards humanity. As Lucas put it, a machine is only as bad as the man that sits behind it. It is an extension of mankind, and if it develops bad technology, it's because the mind behind it was bad. 
Man's relationship to machines is a theme that I have used in all my other films, whether it's a boy in a car or the robots in THX. You see, in previous scripts, the villainous characters all seem to have a limb or something missing. Even Kenobi in previous scripts had an arm missing, and this was an indicator of ambivalence towards technology. If you haven't noticed, this is a nod to Tolkien's views in his legendarium, Nature vs. Industry, if you were. But in the latest scripts, Kenobi is fully organic, while Vader is a machine man. It's a dichotomy that would play out in the entire Star Wars franchise. Lucas would negotiate with Alan Guinness for the role of Ben Kenobi in January, offering him £15,000 per week and 2% of the film's net profits. Guinness said, I suddenly thought I'd make about two or three more films. Feel there's a new kind of filmmaker about. The days of the big cigar are over. They live more simply, and I find them easier to work with. When Guinness was locked in, the other roles simply had to work around the legendary actor. Now hear this. Lucas almost cast Christopher Walken for Han Solo, and a very young Jodie Foster for Leia. Imagine Christopher Walken as Han Solo telling Luke how he knew his dad and how he saved his golden watch room. A fourth draft revision finished on March 15th of 1976. And with it, there was finally a fully established name for Ben Kenobi. Obi-Wan Kenobi. Old Ben. Luke, in this revision, does not know Obi-Wan and Ben are the same person. When Luke meets the man he knows as Old Ben, he tells him that his uncle knew Obi-Wan Kenobi. Guinness would repeat, Of course. Of course I know him. He's me. I haven't gone by the name of Obi-Wan since before you were born. The Force is more hammered out in this revision, and Obi-Wan's abilities with it. With Tarkin blowing up Alderaan, Obi-Wan senses it, and later Darth Vader would sense Obi-Wan's presence aboard the Death Star. Obi-Wan also tells Luke, after giving him a lightsaber, that it is not as clumsy or random as a blaster. It is an elegant weapon for a more civilized time. He also tells Luke that his father was betrayed and murdered by a young Jedi named Darth Vader. It is Obi-Wan who asks Luke to come with him to learn the ways of the Force, not Luke wanting it initially. More scenes are dedicated to showcasing the power of the Force, used by Obi-Wan to enamor Luke, such as the Jedi mind trick with the Imperial Trooper scene. Obi-Wan is much more profound. There are more instances of mentorship. He is literally the wizard pushing Luke along the path. Filming hit in March of 1976, Sir Alec and Lady Guinness arrived in Tuzor, Tunisia. The first scene Guinness was to be filmed in was when Obi-Wan finds Luke in the canyon after the Tusken Raiders attacked him. Interesting to note, much like Obi-Wan mentors Luke, Guinness would also mentor Mark Hamill, especially to help him with the dialogue. Despite the fact they were already filming, Lucas still was revising the script and he was struggling with the key issues. One of the largest issues was that Obi-Wan Kenobi really had nothing to do in the film following the escape from the Death Star. Also, the Death Star theoretically was the most dangerous place in the movie, but there was little to no real drama there. The solution to this problem, he needed to kill off the Jedi Knight. Apparently, the first person to bring up this idea was Lucas's wife, Marcia, who suggested Obi-Wan Kenobi should die at the hands of Darth Vader. Marcia was Lucas's sounding board during the writing process, always questioning him when certain sections didn't make sense or sounded too corny. Lucas considered killing off C-3PO or Chewbacca, but Obi-Wan simply was the only logical choice. It enabled the important point about death and its relation to the Force. Lucas had been toying with the idea of killing Obi-Wan, but only made the decision to do so while filming in the desert of Tunisia. Obi-Wan, as a late entry into the story, his original intent as the old man was to be a vehicle for the film's spirituality. But Lucas had to find plot points that involved him. Lucas took Alec Guinness aside at the end of March while filming and told him he was going to kill him off halfway through the film. Alec was quite emotional about it, saying, You mean I get killed but I don't have a death scene? Guinness would mull over the death of Obi-Wan if he's not happy about it. Lucas met with him later for lunch, and Guinness was very upset, ready to walk off the shooting. Lucas explained the scene to him. Obi-Wan Kenobi 
locked in a duel with Vader, would look to the side and see Luke standing beside Leia. He would smile, knowing there was a new hope, and allow himself to be cut down. But his robe fell, and his body would vanish. He would become one with the Force. The part that really upset Guinness the most was the idea of becoming a ghost. Lucas explained to Guinness that he needed something impactful to happen. Guinness understood the conundrum and came around to the idea agreeing it would be far more effective if his character sacrificed himself. Of course, another large issue was the name Starkiller. Lucas ended up going with Luke Skywalker instead. As he pointed out, I felt a lot of people were confusing him with someone like Charles Manson. It had a very unpleasant connotation. Charles Manson was, of course, the whack job leading a cult that performed murders and was on trial leading up to the film's release. With that, Lucas had really fleshed out the character and much of the mythos around Obi-Wan Kenobi and that of the Jedi as a whole. It is interesting that the character of Obi-Wan Kenobi was to be an older aging professional who would mentor the hero on his journey. Because Alec Guinness was essentially that for the rest of the cast. Alec Guinness was one of the few seasoned veteran actors and would often mentor Mark Hamill. Funny enough, Guinness was not at all convinced of the project from the beginnings, branding it a fairy tale rubbish. He was one of the film's biggest skeptics. Science fiction gave him pause. And amongst other things, he hated the dialogue written for the film. Guinness famously said, New rubbish dialogue reaches me every other day on wages of pink paper and none of it makes my character clear or even bearable. Guinness influenced a lot that would become Kenobi, most notably how the character sacrifices himself. But what else influenced the Obi-Wan Kenobi that we see on the big screen? I have said it probably a hundred times by now, the word wizened, or better said, wizardly. It's no coincidence, Obi-Wan Kenobi's archetype is that of an old man of magical nature. What better comparisons to make the most influential fantasy story written in the Western world? Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. Yes, The Lord of the Rings influenced Star Wars in many major ways. The most obvious, of course, being how it taught Lucas tricks to handle the stuff of myths. Tolkien wrote that myths are the best way to communicate morals, choosing what is right or wrong. For example, take R2 and 3PO, and consider how much alike they are to Frodo and Sam. The innocent pair are guided and guarded by an ensemble fellowship, while they carry their stolen data tapes, much like the One Ring. This MacGuffin device can destroy Sauron, or the Death Star, but must be brought to a location in order to do so. The Death Star is a war machine, that of Mordor. Stormtroopers are orcs, Grand Moff Tarkin is Saruman, Darth Vader is the Witch King of Angmar, with the Emperor as Sauron. Who is Obi-Wan Kenobi, if you haven't guessed? Well, of course, it's Gandalf the Grey. Lucas went on the record to state during the interviews that choosing between right and wrong would be integral to the Jedi and the Sith, represented early on by Obi-Wan Kenobi and Darth Vader. He also said Gandalf and the Witch King of Angmar directly influenced Obi-Wan Kenobi and Darth Vader, particularly their clash during the Return of the King during which the Witch King of Angmar breaks Gandalf's staff. In one of the early drafts of Lucas's script, there is an exchange of dialogue between Obi-Wan Kenobi and Luke, which is literally taken from a conversation between Gandalf and Bilbo in The Hobbit. Here is how it was written for scene 39 of the third draft for Star Wars. Kenobi approaches with, Good morning. What do you mean, good morning? Luke responds, do you mean that it is a good morning for you, or do you wish me a good morning, although it is obvious I'm not having one? Or do you find that mornings in general are good? All of them at once, replies Kenobi. In the end, the dialogue was dropped. I am sure for copyright reasons. I mean, come on, Mr. Lucas. But elements of Gandalf were not. When the Fellowship is threatened by Durin's bane within the mines of Moria, is it not the wise old man Gandalf who takes out his glowing blue sword to face off against the Balrog, holding a red flaming sword. Gandalf sacrifices his life so that the others can escape as Luke screams, No! And what happens after Gandalf dies? Well, his divine being left 
his set physical form, darkness took him. But after 20 days, the Valor sent Gandalf back to Middle-earth for a brief time until his task was done. Obi-Wan Kenobi sacrifices himself likewise, but did he truly die? He came back, if only for a time to continue his task. But both Gandalf and Obi-Wan Kenobi eventually pass on to another realm. Gandalf proceeds to the Undying Lands and Obi-Wan Kenobi tells Luke in their last meeting within a dream he must move on from his spirit form to another realm. Allegynus had converted to Roman Catholicism and was an avid reader, and when interviewed about Star Wars, he once stated, Lucas suggested to me my character was something of a samurai warrior, and Obi-Wan is indeed dressed for the part, but he is also said to be a wise man, kind of monk-like character. I think he borrowed from Tolkien's The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. The Catholic undertones should also not be ignored when looking at Star Wars. May the Force be with you rings awfully close to the Lord be with you. And on that note, Gandalf and Obi-Wan Kenobi, of course, the wizardly image goes much, much deeper. It is an ancient character after all. One can point towards the Nubragendid. Within that story, a mysterious figure throws back his hood and reveals to the audience he is Odin, similar to how Gandalf and Obi-Wan make their first appearances. And of course, there is Merlin from the Arthurian legend, written by Geoffrey Mammoth, the Historia Regnium Britanni, published in 1138, was a blend of Welsh myths and an interesting history about a Welsh chieftain of the 6th century. And a whole lot of imagination. We have a video on that on our sister channel, Kings and Generals. New Hope had made many references to the Arthurian legend. We see a father and son, an orphan theme, as well as a rebellion and reconciliation. The orphan Luke seizes the sword and becomes the hero. He is mentored by a wizened wizard. Obi-Wan Kenobi, his Merlin. The ancient sword in the stone is honestly found in just about any ancient story, but it has a profound influence on the relationship between Luke and Obi-Wan Kenobi. Arthur's father, Uther, was a powerful knight who made some very bad life choices. Merlin gives Uther Excalibur, hoping it will unite the land, but Uther's lust for power leads him down a dark path. Wink, wink. You can now see how the story of Anakin plays out with Uther, but Merlin realizes that Uther's son, Arthur, is the true future king, or that Luke can help bring balance to the Force. Merlin makes sure Arthur is spirited away from his mother and younger half-sister, Morgana. Instead, he will grow up as a simple peasant in the countryside, perhaps a moisture farm. If anyone needs to farm more moisture in the wet hell called Britain, I am sorry, God save the Queen. When Luke and Arthur come of age, Arthur pulls Excalibur from the same stone his father plunged it into before his death, and Luke receives his father's lightsaber before his death. Merlin and Obi-Wan then inform Arthur and Luke their true destiny, that Guinevere cheats on Arthur with Lancelot, causing Arthur to fall into a deep depression, and then his sister Morgana seduces him, becomes pregnant with Mordred, who then kills Arthur later on. So perhaps scramble the last part of it, just a tad. I mean, sprinkle in a bit of wind zest, and am I right, Bufaz? Anyways, thank God for Han Solo, Mr. Lucas. I know you wanted to keep the Japanese influence, but never go full Oni-chan. Amongst the other hundreds of films and literature that would influence Star Wars, a rather large one that goes unnoticed was The Wizard of Oz. As the late Roger Ilbert put it, Star Wars is a fairy tale, a fantasy, a legend, finding its roots in some of our most popular fiction. The Golden Robot, Lion Face Space Pilot, the insecure little computer on wheels, must be suggesting the Tin Man, the Cowardly Lion, and the Scarecrow. Roger Ilbert further elaborated making connections between Luke and Dorothy. Both live with their aunt and uncle on a farm. Both are looking for something more. Their world is thrown upside down, literally for Dorothy and the tornado, and for Luke with the murder of his aunt and uncle. They both go on a journey where they meet companions on their way to face Vader and Oz. From a cinematographic point of view, you can see the similarities. For example, how the Emperor's hologram is projected to the audience is very much like how the wizard's head is addressing Dorothy and her friends. Lucas also has gone on the record to say 
much of Star Wars was an allegory for the Vietnam War. Believe it or not, he said, It was really about the Vietnam War, and that was a period where Nixon was trying to run for a second term, which got me thinking, historically, how do democracies get turned into dictatorships? When he began writing in 1973, he penciled often a large technological empire going after a small group of freedom fighters. When A New Hope starts, we see a massive Star Destroyer chasing down a small fleeing ship. In that sense, there's a lot of asymmetry of power in the universe, a struggle between the Empire and the rebels. Lucas also stated he based Palpatine on Richard Nixon, a man who tried to subvert the Senate, pretending to be a nice guy. Not gonna lie, a bold strategy showcasing America as an evil galactic empire attacking Vietnam. It worked for Lucas. If you really want to delve deeper to the core of it all, Star Wars, much like any other story today, was influenced by the mythos and religions of our past, as even the Bible is part of Star Wars. The plot of Episode 4 can be seen as the story of Saul and David. A long, long time ago, in a desert far, far away, lived a young man living a simple life who is anointed the future leader. The king-to-be undergoes training, but shows instances of disobedience, the influence of the dark side. The wise prophet gradually came to regret crowning the young king, and would later find a suitable replacement for the chosen one. This replacement was a farm boy, and the first king wants to see this newly anointed second king dead. You can pretty much find any analogy you want, such as Luke destroying the Death Star, symbolizing the fight between David and Goliath. One well-aimed shot took down the giant. Saul's daughter Mikkel, much like Princess Leia, sides with the Ursuper farm boy against the ruling king. Hell, if you really are looking hard enough, consider the scene where Obi-Wan says to Darth Vader, You can't win. Strike me down and I will become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. One could argue it's reminiscent of Christ's sacrifice, death on the cross, allowing himself to be crucified. Obi-Wan Kenobi began as General Luke Skywalker, literally the aging general Rokuroto Makabe. He is a veteran warrior, aiding a princess and some rebel youth. He is both mentor and hero. Then, he became more hashed out. He was a large man in his 60s, with his allegiance to Aquilia. He is asked by his friend, Kane Starkiller, to take his son as a Padawan learner. The role of surrogate father and mentor, if you were but he is still also the hero overshadowing the young Anakin. Then Lucas decided to change him again, writing on a note, Starkiller, Mifune, a cross between Yojimbo and Seven Samurai. Lucas still had Toshiro Mifune on his mind when he was thinking about the character, but now he was looking to divide the character. Luke Starkiller is a young Padawan, the hero. The other, described for the first time as a wise and old man, is simply named The Starkiller. He is Luke's father and an aging Jedi Bendu master, the mentor. Lucas was still struggling. It was not quite right, but he knew he needed this old man. Lucas delved deeper into the mythos. The character needed to be the old man on the side of the road. He is not simply an aging warrior. He is in fact a wizard. This wizard will mentor the hero, the Merlin, to his Arthur. Lucas had finally found his proper archetype, but the old man still had no name. Lucas got to writing again, and the old man had acquired a new name, General Ben Kenobi, a wise and old man, and a Jedi who occupies the role of mentor to Luke in the ways of the force of others. General Kenobi knew Luke's father and commanded forces during the Clone Wars. He is a seasoned warrior. Kenobi saves the group from Darth Vader as they escape into the sunset. But something was missing. Lucas got to writing yet again. Now his full name is Obi-Wan Kenobi, but he also goes by Old Ben. His past is more mysterious because of this now. When Luke says his name, he says, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Obi-Wan. Now that's a name I haven't heard in a long time. A long time. Most curious. Obi-Wan Kenobi is the mentor as always, but he has evolved into a monk like mystical warrior. He becomes the envisioned aging Jedi master, a monk of the desert. He is much like Gandalf. He helps the heroes along their quest. He knows things that none others seem to know. However, there is a single puzzle piece missing from all of this. Obi-Wan Kenobi needs to make an emotional impact on Luke and the story of Star Wars. 
He needs to die. Obi-Wan Kenobi thus sacrifices himself, much like Gandalf, and just like Gandalf, does not truly die, but is reborn in a fashion to continue helping the hero grow and to reach his full potential. It's hard to negate the other films, comic books, TV series, video games, that all involve Obi-Wan Kenobi. For me, during the early 1990s was when I was a wee lad, and I saw Star Wars Episode Four for the first time. I think perhaps I was maybe five years old. Disregarding everything I have learnt about the character and trying to fine tune the original 1977 film, who exactly is Obi-Wan Kenobi? Now please, Take my perspective with a grain of salt. As a kid, I actually liked the Super Mario Brothers movie. That should tell you enough about me and how dumb I was. The first thing that comes to mind is ironically a title Lucas gave the character when he was just emerging as an individual. The old man. The wise an old man, someone who has seen things, done things, gone on adventures. He is more than just a warrior, he is mystical, a sort of wizard who conjures magic, but that magic has a name, the Force. He is a mentor, a teacher, a guide to the hero. He pushes Luke to take up the quest, after Luke loses his aunt and uncle to the Empire. We don't really know who Obi-Wan Kenobi was prior to Episode 4, but he has this unexplainable protectiveness towards Luke. We know he knew Luke's father that he was a war hero from something called the Clone Wars. Boy, did that make for playground theories. This mystical warrior could sway the minds of others, duel using a lightsaber. He showed Luke his inner potential and allowed him to grow. Everyone could use a mentor in their life. Someone who has an understanding of the world that came before your time. The ways of the Jedi were fading. The Empire had almost crushed the rebellion. Obi-Wan Kenobi sacrifices himself, the last of the Jedi, and as he does, so does he smile, looking over at Luke, for there is a new hope. When I saw the film in my youth, I could not help but see Obi-Wan Kenobi as the father Luke never had. In fact, the father figure in the earlier scripts were all scrapped for Obi-Wan Kenobi's character. What is rather ironic, Luke doesn't know about his father at all. It's Obi-Wan who connects him to his Jedi roots by telling him about his father being a respected Jedi. He also tells Luke he was his friend. This is Luke's first introduction to who his father was. Obi-Wan gives Luke his lightsaber, the one that his father had used in the past, and offers to train him. From the offset, Obi-Wan is Luke's protector. He warns him not to go back home, to spare him from seeing the death of his aunt and uncle. He protected Luke from the Tusken Raiders, from thugs in the cantina, and ultimately, from having to confront Darth Vader. When Luke loses his aunt and uncle, he has nothing. Obi-Wan literally becomes the pillar of emotional support for him. Even after death, Obi-Wan continues to support Luke in destroying the Death Star. It's quite a beautiful quasi-father-son story if you see it from that angle, and as a kid, that's how I saw it. A touching story of passing the torch or the sword, as Alec Guinness said. And then you get to see the horrifying Mustafar scene where Obi-Wan Kenobi cuts Anakin practically in half and lets his ass blaze like a human bonfire and spends the rest of the time gaslighting the hell out of Luke. But that's for another story. We are planning more videos like that. So the usual things, like, share, comment, show the video to your wife's boyfriend, whatever works. When we don't make boomer tier jokes, we release fantasy and sci-fi battle lore documentaries including Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, Warhammer 40k, the other better Warhammer, Witcher, and other universes. Just click somewhere here and here. And this has been Craig for the Wizards and Warriors channel and we will catch you on the next one.